Hello, this topic considers tax issues related to partnership operations. So before we dive into the respective issues, the first thing I want to talk about is the idea of subchapter K and the theory behind it. When Congress was considering how exactly to tax partnerships, there was really two competing theories. Before we discuss the theories, it's important to remember that partnerships are taxed at a single level. The partnership itself is not taxed, however, it flows through the partnership to the actual owners. However, for various issues, it makes sense that we consider the partnership as a taxable entity, just not paying tax on itself. These two theories are called the entity theory and the aggregate theory of taxation. So the entity theory says that a partnership is a separate entity with respect to tax purposes. So a separate entity with respect to tax purposes. And being a separate entity, it's separate from its owners, who each of its owners have various accounting methods and tax years. So the partnership itself, under the entity theory of taxation, and this is how the rules work, actually calculates its tax year on one single year for the partnership. Now we'll talk about the specific rules of how it calculates it, but there's only one tax year. You don't actually look at each respective partner and say, okay, well, you were going to flow through the items and it's you know determined in each partner. That would be too difficult, especially if you have hundreds of partners. The accounting method, the same idea. Different partners could be corporations or individuals, and they could have accrual versus cash method of accounting. That creates another issue. So we do one just based on the partnership itself. There's other things that the entity theory comes into play, such as elections, um, for example, in section 1033, involuntary conversion, which must be election or installment sales. All of those election must take place. And think about the issues you might have where you have hundreds of partners. Some partners might not want to make the election, but others do. So some might make, some might make the respective election, others won't. That creates all sorts of a headache with respect to figuring out the different tax ramifications. If we just do it one time for the entity, it's a lot easier to compute. The aggregate theory goes to the whole general idea that there's only one level of tax and that the items of the partnership flow through to the owners. They flow through to the owners, which as I mentioned, is the actual idea of partnership taxation. There's only one single level of taxation, not double taxation like C corporations. So you'll see these competing theories as we consider the various rules throughout the entire partnership taxation, but even specifically so in this discussion. So section 701, 702, and 703 deal with partners and how they report on their share of partnership income, gain, loss, deduction, credit. Section 704 determines each partner's share of partnership items. Now this is really determining the partners, how we do, how we break up, how we allocate. So it's important to understand, I'm going to write it here at the top, allocate versus distribute. So as I mentioned, a partnership does not pay tax. It flows through to the individual owners. However, every year, a partnership allocates income, loss, deduction, credits, gains to the partners. Allocation, even if they're not distributed. Distributed means that cash or property is actually being distributed from the partnership to the owners. Allocated is just on paper, it's what each respective partner has to pay on his or her share. So it's important to understand those two distinctions. So section 04 deals with how exactly do we allocate. Now that is a, um, a tough topic because under the Internal Revenue Code, it says that we look at the partnership agreement and it will be respected assuming that the allocation meets substantial economic effect. We're not going to go into what substantial economic effect means because that's beyond the scope and that's for a more advanced topic. Section 705 deals with how we calculate the partner's outside adjusted basis. So remember, under Section 722 in a previous topic, we covered the outside adjusted basis on contribution or formation. This is saying how do we determine it after that initial contribution. And then Section 706 deals with the taxable year of the partnership, which remember, under the entity theory, 
under the entity theory, there's only going to be one taxable year. We don't gonna, we're not going to give you know, each partner his or her own taxable year with respect to the items flowing through. All right. So the first thing is the flow through of partnership items. And this is res with respect to section 701, 702, and 703. Now, this is really the aggregate theory of taxation, aggregate theory. And what it really says is that we have two types of items. We have the, the bottom line item. So we have two items here. We have what's called the bottom line income or loss. versus separately stated items. So the separately stated items are items that based on two things. They're, they're really based on the partner. They're particular to the partner. Different partners can have different treatments. So they're particular to the partner. So let me give you some examples to understand. So I'll show you over here. So the first one I want to talk about Charitable contributions. So charitable contribution deductions are separately stated because recall from maybe a previous topic where you learned about charitable contributions, there's various limitations based on AGI if you're an individual and taxable income if you're a corporation. So we can't calculate charitable contribution deduction for the partnership because you can't flow that over to the individual partner because there might be a limit on, you know, in terms of what they actually can take. So we actually calculate that on a separately stated, a separate partner basis. Another example would be pretty much any capital gains and losses, capital gains or losses. Because remember that capital gains and losses have special rules with respect to offsetting. And, you know, um, for example, individuals can use capital uh, gains, I'm sorry, capital losses to offset to 3000 you know, all capital gains and then up to $3,000 of ordinary income. But corporations, that's not the case. Capital losses offset capital gains and that's it. So there's special rules with respect to different owners, depending on whether you're a corporation or an individual or just various limitations. So those are really the two reasons why we have separately stated items. We have one limits. So based, so let's say we have all the same type of owner, all individuals. Well, there's different limitations, you know, with respect to each um, individual because they might have different numbers. And then two, with respect to type of owner, corporations versus individuals. So it's important to understand that if something could, this could happen, not does it, could. It's a hypothetical situation. Could it ever, could it ever provide some type of issue? Then it's considered separately stated. And what does separately stated do? If you look at a schedule K1, if you, look, if you look at a schedule K1, you'll see that a schedule, and I want you to look at schedule K1, and you'll, you know, um, you'll see that there's various items that have to be separately stated, and these are just some of them. There's others out there that aren't reported, but the idea is they have to be separately stated. The bottom line income or loss number is any item that does not have to be separately stated because regardless of the type of taxpayer, it will be the same treatment. So perfect examples include any type of ordinary income and most types of ordinary loss. So mo ordinary income will be treated as ordinary income, no limits or types of owner issues. It will be, tr it'll be ordinary for all those types. So ordinary income is always going to be this bottom line. And what we do is we actually net and most type of ordinary losses. Most ordinary losses and most and most losses which are ordinary. So some examples of ordinary losses that would not be considered um, part of this bottom line, depreciation is an ordinary loss, right? Well, for corporations, because of various issues with respect to earnings and profits calculation, and various adjustments that have to be made, even AMT, it creates issues. And again, we it's a could. Could it ever create an issue? Not does it. Don't, we don't actually look at the respective partners of a partnership and say, oh, it doesn't create an issue because they're all the same. There are, no corp there are no corporate partners. No, it's could it ever, ever. So we combine the ordinary business income and deductions 
that we that are possible. There's no issues. So again, separately stated ones, you have to look at the various items. So some examples include charitable contributions, uh, long-term, short-term capital gains, 1231, depreciation, items like that. That again, depending on the owner, you would you might have some distinctions. All right, so the next topic is taxable year. So section 706 deals with the rule for taxable year. And what it says is that we use a three-tier waterfall. We use a three-tier waterfall. So this is a waterfall, which remember from our previous discussions, any waterfall rule means you have to go down. So if we meet the number, first one, we stop. Meet, if we don't meet the first one, we meet the second one, we stop. If we don't meet the first or second, the third will always work. Now the idea here is that different partners prefer to defer income. Remember the theme in tax that partners prefer, oh, I'm sorry, taxpayers prefer to defer income. So that's also true with respect to tax year. A, an, an owner wants to defer as long as possible. So generally speaking, if you have all 1231 calendar year owners, they want a January 31st because they get to defer for additional year with respect to the partner's income that's going to be reported on the individual owner's actual, ta uh, actual 1040, their actual individual return. So that's why we have these rules because before we had these rules, partners could partnerships could just pick the rule whatever tax year they wanted. And again, you'd have this issue where they would defer as long as possible. So the first rule is that if you have a group of partners that have more than 50%, it's more, more than 50%. So greater than 50%. So I'll just put it over here on the side, greater than 50% of profits and it has to be and capital. And they all have the same tax year. So you can add up. Then that's the year the partnership must use. Must use. Second test, okay, so if you fail the first one, you continue the waterfall. If all the partners, all the all the partners that have at least 5% of capital or profits, not and, or profits, have the same year, then you must elect. You must elect that year. So this is where, let's say you have, um, let's say you have 20 partners. And A and B, I'm sorry, let me change the example. Let's say you have 100 partners, and A and B are the only partners that have very very large ownership. Let's say that A and B each own 20% of the partnership, and they both have a July 31st year end. C, I'm sorry, all the other partners, so A and B are the are partners, both have 20%, so they own 40%, which is less than 50, right? Less than 50. And, and they are on a... A, um, a July 31st year end. Let's say that all the other partners have less than 5% ownership, whether capital or profit, doesn't matter. And they have all various year ends, but nobody has, again, the first test. Well, in that case, because A and B are the only par partners that are principal partners, and because they um, have the same year, you must use that July 31st in that example. Now, what if we fail the first test, second test, and we do the third test? then we have to use what's called the least aggregate deferral method. Least aggregate deferral. What we do is we look at all the partners of the partnership and we basically test all the possible year ends. We test all the possible year ends of the partnership with respect to each partner. And we look at their, so we test all year ends and we do it based on ownership. We do it based on ownership percentage. And you see which one provides the least aggregate deferral when looking at all the partners in total. And that's how you do that. It's best to go through that one using looking at an example if you have one. Now that's the general rule under 706. If you have a super, supervening exam, a supervening, which basically means a supervening rule means that it can trump, okay, so let's say you determine that you that you're gonna have a year end based on rule number one, or rule number two, or rule number three. If you have a supervening um, issue rule, then it would trump that, and you could use that year end. So a partnership may adopt a natural business year end, which means that if 25% or more of gross receipts occur, occur in two months, and the last two months of the year you pick, then you can use that year end. So let me do an example. Let's say that we have a partnership. 
And the partnership has three partners, A, B, and C, all equal partners. And they have a December 31st year end. And they're all individuals. Well, under year one, I'm sorry, year one, under um, our waterfall, number one, the partnership must use 1231. Now, let's say this partnership sells Halloween costumes. Now, I'm not sure if you know about the Halloween costume industry, but most of the Halloween costumes, you know, you see those shops pop up, you know, in various strip malls, and they're usually only there. They start maybe, they come in about the end of July, August, right? They come like sometime around late July, early August. So let's just say they come in in August, but they do most of their business in September and October. And after that, they're gone. So this is what, you know, they do most of it. They probably do greater than 50% in September. Let's just say they do 70% of their business in September and October. Well, that is more than 25% of their business. More than 25% of their gross. Well, it doesn't have to be 20. It's at 20. It doesn't have to be more than that. It has to be at least. But again, they do well more than that. So 25% or more. So they can pick a 10, a 1031, 1031 year end because you're looking at the last two months, September, October, and you pick that last day. So as long as more than I'm sorry, equal to or more than 25% of the gross receipts happen during the last two months of the year end you pick, which here we picked December, um, October 31st, you're good. So that can trump the 1231. All right, so outside basis. So remember that with respect to a partner's outside basis, which is the actual partner, basis in his or her partnership interests. On contribution, under section 722, we carry over. Right, we add any gain recognized, which that's pretty rare unless there's, you know, unless there's boot. And what we do is, as the partnership goes on, the operations, operations just means as the life of the partnership goes on, we increase by the partner's share of income, the allocated items, allocated, including tax exempt items. We increase for tax exempt items so that the partner is not to ever tax on those items when the partner sells the basis. I'm sorry, when the partner um, sells his or her interest. Because the idea is that tax exempt interest or income will actually increase the value of the partnership. So again, the value of your partnership interest goes up, but your basis hasn't been adjusted. So we have to adjust for that. We also increase. So first we increase for any allocated income or gains. Then we increase for any basis of contributions. So when we might contribute more during the year. Then we decrease for any losses or deductions. And we decrease for any property distributed. Now, note the effect of Section 752, which is liabilities. So liabilities can come in during the year. The partnership can take on more liabilities during the year. And when that happens, when the partnership takes on more liabilities, sorry, it's an I there, then it's viewed as the partner a deemed contribution or a deemed distribution of cash, which can increase the basis. That's important. Now, one thing I want to know, and you're going to have to compare this to S corporations later on, when it comes to partnerships, when we have a distribution, we look at the adjusted basis at the date the distribution occurs. At date distribution occurs. So you're going to, you're going to contrast this with S corporations when you learn about that, which happens at the end of the year. So the last thing to, to consider is the use of losses. So yes, losses will adjust the basis, but whether a partner can actually take a loss depends on three things. First, losses are limited to the partner's outside basis the time that they occur. Next, we have to consider the rules of Section 465, the at-risk limitation, which I have a separate video for that discussion, as well as the passive activity loss. So any portion of a loss the partner cannot take will be suspended until the future, until there's future future basis, until future basis comes in and then the partner can use it. So this really ends our discussion of the operations of a partnership and the tax issues related to them.